Thank you, and thank you, Madhu and Priyanka, for asking me to come and speak here. Um, I mean, I found Georgia and Ramesh's presentations fascinating. I have a totally different perspective, as you can well imagine. I come from a, um, a field which is just full of shit. So I have to deal with things in a very, we have to deal with things in a very different way. Um, Madhu and Priyanka particularly asked me to speak on CSC's work on air pollution. So even though most of you know me for my work on shit and excreta, I will stick to air pollution today because I think it'll help to explain some of the kind of work that we have done and particularly in terms of how have we found that we could make a difference? What did it take to get the issue of air pollution out um, into all our lives? And that's what I will talk about. You know, for many of you, you wouldn't know this when you're sitting in Delhi today, that actually CSE's work on air pollution began in the 90s. And um, when I thought about it, and actually because of Madhu and Priyanka, I thought about it, that what happened? I mean, in the 90s, it just seemed so much easier as compared to today to get action. We were breathing foul air, the air was completely dark at that time, but pollution was not an issue on people's agenda. In fact, I remember when we started talking about air pollution in the 90s, there was a certain sense of shock about it, which is, you know, is there really a pollution problem? And part of it, of course, was the problem of what I call Lutayan Delhi which is that uh, we were dealing with uh, people who live in a part of the city which actually has no problems. And so they would never see any visual sense of the pollution. They would never understand that there is a health impact on it. And I remember at the first times when we started trying to build a public campaign on air pollution, trying to get doctors involved with it, uh, there was so much reluctance, there was so much resistance because one, the issue of pollution was not on the agenda. Two, the automobile lobby uh, was very strong, and there was a pushback from the automobile lobby to say that don't put this on the agenda. And um, when we raised the issue of diesel pollution in, um, in late 1990s, uh, Anil and I got a defamation suit from Tata Motors of 100 crore. Uh, the doctors who we were beginning to build alliances with uh, turned around and said, no, we can't talk to you anymore. We don't want to talk about diesel because, you know, there is generally a lot of public pressure on us, or, I mean, a lot of pressure on us not to talk about this issue. But regardless of that, and in spite of that, and I think that's one of the lessons when I take back, in spite of that, we did get enormous action in the 90s. We got the entire movement towards compressed natural gas. If you remember, the CNG, what you see today, happened in 1998. It was brought in in 2001. We moved the entire city out of petrol and diesel in use in buses and three-wheelers into CNG in a matter of three years. The scale of transition was enormous. And because the scale of transition was big, you got an impact that was big. You could actually see clean air at that time. Now, what did it take us to do this at that stage? The first was that we had to have a solution. We had to propose what could be an alternative. So it's very critical, and I will repeat this as I talk about our, our challenges today, it's very important in our world to be able to have a solution to move the issue forward. Because it's not good enough to say it is bad air. It is not good enough to say it is polluted air. But it is important to be able to say, here is a solution. And in that case, we said compressed natural gas was a solution. It was a very difficult solution to conceptualize. It was an even more difficult solution to implement. And I'm saying this because in some cases where we all stand today on the sanitation story has great parallels. 
When we talked about CNG in 1998, the biggest use of CNG was in California, which was 80 buses. And the only, and the question that we kept uh, being asked is, but it hasn't been done anywhere. How are you proposing this as a solution? Do you have the technical, we don't have the technical abilities to do so. Now the reason we were proposing it as a solution then, as all of us today are proposing uh, an alternate sewage management system today is because it was just so right, it was so logical. The fact is that if India took incremental steps to clean up diesel, it would take us 20 years. Because that's what it took Europe, that's what it took the United States. If you took diesel and petrol and you decided to clean it up incrementally, but by moving to gas, by moving to compressed natural gas, changing the fuel, you got a 15-year advancement, a 15-year leapfrog. So the persuasiveness of the story was to be able to convince both the decision makers as well as in our case, the courts, that here was a solution which was a game changer. And here was a solution which was actually far more easier to reach than the solution that they were proposing, which is at that stage to move from BS0 diesel to BS1, BS2, BS3, BS4. And remember, we are not even at BS6 today. Bharat stage one, two, three, four, which means cleaning up the sulfur in diesel from 10,000 parts per million to 10 parts per million. That's what it took. By moving to CNG, you got 10 parts per million of sulfur in one stroke. So it was the leapfrog solution, but what it took us to get it implemented, and that's where many of us stand today. What it took us to get it implemented was enormous persistence, perseverance, and technical uh, abilities to be able to stand behind it. I have three more minutes, so I'm going to skip years and bring you to where I am today. The fact is that post CNG, we found that we had lost all the gains that we had made because pollution was rising once again, but now we did not have an audience who wanted to listen to the story because it wasn't a crisis anymore. So the question was, how do you explain a, a problem when it's not in your face? And what we did, and I think it's taken us the last three years to turn this around, what we did was very interesting. We, we bought portable monitors at that time to test air pollution. And today, when I walk into Oberoi Hotel, I have this bizarre sign which says, in our rooms, it's only five and outside is 57. I mean, it's probably rubbish, but that's okay. The very fact that they put it up, it means that somebody here cares about it, which is the people who are coming to stay in their rooms. But the issue is in their face today. At that time, we bought portable monitors to test air pollution, and we decided on a strategy which was uh, pretty much as Ramesh would say it, except I don't have any of your words to say this. We just decided on it because it just seems so delicious to do, which is we gave it to five people we selected who we knew were powerful in the city. And we said, you use it for 24 hours, for 48 hours, and you test the pollution on yourself. And one of the persons we gave it to was a top, uh, in fact, the amicus in our case, Mr. Harish Salve, who's a top as you know, lawyer, we gave it to an asthmatic, we gave it to somebody who walks in Lodi Gardens. And the reason we gave it to somebody who walks in Lodi Gardens is because the rich in, in this city always believed that pollution didn't affect them. And we needed to make it clear that pollution was a great equalizer, that pollution affects the poor and the rich, and that it's important for the rich to understand that the air shed is one that whatever air purifier they use and however much people in Oberoi Hotel feel that they have clean air, they're going to have to breathe Delhi's air. And that if Delhi's air is not clean, it is bad for them. Now when this data came out, this was shocking. 
And we did something even more interesting. We were asked to bring a monitor and put it inside the Supreme Court in the Chief Justice's court. So we took the monitor, this is about three and a half years ago, and we took it right in front of the Chief Justice and we had it ticking all the time. And he was interested in knowing, so how bad is it? How bad is it? And obviously, we got concerned. And that, in some senses, got the matter out there. It got pollution in people's faces. We then built huge amount of public pressure through putting out information. And this is where I completely disagree with the word you use, but completely, totally. We cannot afford to create uncertainty. We cannot afford to create doubt. You must be credible in every piece of information you give out. You must be absolutely sure of that information and be able to stand behind it 150%. We are not in the business of selling toothpaste. We are not in the business of selling junk. We're in the business of change. And change only comes when people on the other side believe you. Credibility is the bottom line of anything that you and I do. And that's something that has been absolutely time-tested again and again. And the other thing that is also very clear is that you have to be able to stand behind the evidence you have. You have to be able to, be able to contest it, fight it, and stand behind it. We've had, even today, we are faced with huge numbers of challenges. We are told diesel is clean. We are told cars don't pollute. We are told thermal power plants don't have a pollution problem. Pet coke should be imported from the United States because it has higher calorific value. We are told that pollution, in fact, has no health impact. This is what our own minister has told the parliament. Okay, it's on record. This is what the ministry told the, the Supreme Court. But how do you fight it? Through facts, through information, through constant research, to being able to stay ahead and keep being sure that you do not make a mistake. And that, to me, is the biggest lesson that we have learned. We cannot afford to even get a comma wrong. And I have to tell you, it terrifies me, okay? But it is something that is critical. So at the end, what has worked? And I'll wrap up because I've been told time's up. I'm going to wrap up with just four, five big things that I think work. One, I think when I've looked at behavior change, and in our world, this, you know, this issue of behavior change is a big one, okay? I work on climate change. I'm constantly told, how do you move societies to change? What do you do? If you look at it, the one big thing that has happened, which has actually happened in our two things that have happened, one for the good, one for the bad, one is tobacco. Today, if anybody smokes, even in my office, a hell of a lot of people smoke, unfortunately. But I frown at them, and people nag them. And in other parts of the world, they look down upon them. The other is, you and I are eating a lot more junk food, okay? Both have happened deliberately. And I think we need to understand, therefore, behavior change is possible. Both because, on one hand, companies devised us to eat junk food because they made sure that we, they changed eating habits through all the, the, the power of their media. On the other hand, we also found that you could contest companies by changing habits in terms of smoking. So there was the evidence on health. And today, when I'm seeing, we do a lot of work on junk food, as you know, at CSC. Uh, one of the only reasons we are seeing that companies are running away in fear is because there is a lot more evidence on health out there. Obesity has become a big issue. Children are worried about it, okay? Even if parents are not enough. So I think one of the things that we have learned is behavior change in our world happens when you make more and more sharper, deeper links with health. And we need to work at it 
much more when it comes to water and sanitation. We know it has an impact, but the evidence on it, the data on it, the constant verification of that data, we need to do a lot more of. Two, we need to be able to shout out our message. There is no doubt. But the shouting out can never be done with the same stridency as Amir Khan. And forget it. We are not in that world. You do not have the communication ability nor the amount of noise around you to be able to do that. Your ability to shout out the message is to stay strong, focused, and loud in the fact that it is a public message. And for this, you need to make sure that you have the credibility behind you. And that, to me, is the third most important part of it. CSC had a challenge. I'm sorry, madam. I'll take another minute on this, just to finish this. Uh, the lady with the time out. OK. <laughs> One more minute. I'll just finish with this. Uh, you know, one of our very interesting challenges that happened in the last years is, as you know, air pollution is now a big business. And one of the biggest benefit, uh, the people who are benefiting from air pollution are the air purifier companies. Okay? Now, a uh, lot of TV companies try to have, have done programs with air purifier businesses uh, basically sponsoring it. So we are knowledge partners to many media one, um, you know, one sector we work with very closely. A lot of people came to us asking us to be knowledge partners. But one of the rules is we don't care how powerful you are. We don't care who you are. We will not partner with you if an air purifier company is involved. We will not. Because our credibility comes from the fact that when I talk about air pollution, people listen because they know I have no vested interest attached to it. So my public credibility is more important to me in terms of messaging than anything else. And the last thing really is, as I started with, we must be able to have solutions and the technical ability to be able to stand behind the solutions to propose and not let anybody dispose. That has to be our bottom line. So that's really what we have found in our work, and I look forward to any, I look forward to a continued discussion on this. Thank you very much.